Before we begin, P.S., there's a survey for Cypher Sci-Fi. TheCypherSci-Fi.com slash survey. Beep boop, intro music. Welcome to Cypher Sci-Fi. I explore how and why. I'm Christopher Peterson. I'm Lee Colbert. Colbert, we, we watched a good movie. You were there, I'm telling you. Yes, I was there. In fact, I, I suggested the movie, too. Everybody else, we watched a good movie. And in fact, I would say maybe watch this before listening to the episode, not because it was revealed or anything, just because it was really fun. I was real surprised. I didn't even know it existed. And then, bam, good movie. It's, uh, what movie did we watch, Colbert? Upgrade. Uh, spoiler alert. I'm going to spoil the movie. Colbert, what is Upgrade about? Uh, dude has a, not quite a hit, but a job put down on him that he doesn't know about. Becomes uh, quadriplegic. And hey, guess what? There's a super chip. Make him move again. Also happens to be an AI. And hey, guess what? It winds up taking over. And then hijinks ensue. That's, I always <laughs> say hijinks. It was, though. It was really fun. Because then he gets to have, like, sort of AI superpowers, and it makes for some comedy, and it was really fun. And then the ending was really good, too. Especially the ending, maybe. But we'll get there, I guess. The opening is pr- kind of dark that he, like, gets paralyzed, and his wife gets murdered. Right in front of him, and he can't look away like, right from anything that. because he's paralyzed. They spent just enough time endearing us to this couple that it was like, oh man, this is kind of dark. But then we do get to see some of the world, and it's it looks pretty nice, actually. Yeah, I can imagine it being possible in 20 years. Yeah, I don't think they gave a year, but it, it looks like a very reasonable, give it a couple decades from now, future. Which, once it got dark, and like he, you know, his wife gets killed and everything, I thought we were going to see the dystopia and the, the cyberpunk sort of wealth disparity sadness. the boot. Yeah, but it didn't have that at all. It just looked it looked pretty nice. And where it didn't look so nice, it just looked like people getting by, not like sad dystopia at all. And, I mean, there is the surveillance state, but that's not... Sure, some things seem to have run away, like the surveillance state. And I guess there are the unfortunates in society. But everything I saw is stuff I could see now in the right place. And so it wasn't surprising, except for the drones that track everybody who has a chip. But I, I don't, I'm not surprised that that would happen on the road we're on. The city looked nice. We see people in their driverless cars with like the computerized opaque windows, vampire daybreaker style. But what really features is bio enhancement and like big data technology. For once, for once, actually, the police are not, they're still just people doing their jobs, but they, the lay police officer we see is actually assisted by like big data stuff. Thanks to the surveillance state. <laughs> Seems to be a large part of the job. Yeah. Like everybody's just well, on hey, screen. People are suspects. I'm like, no, it's not. Yeah, it is. He's with the cops because they're investigating, not so well, he does, a better, he does a better job himself, but they're investigating his wife's murder and his paralyzation, the attack. And they do one of those enhanced moves. Wait, he does it, doesn't he? They don't, because just... the thing does, that doesn't really exist, <laughs> for the most part. But uh, but no, they don't. The cops do not enhance. He himself, in his own investigation, enhances. He, uh, he does the enhance and blows up the picture and is able to... Use his AI integrated chip. We have to explain uh, at this at the point in the movie where he does the the super enhanced move and it works, sort of. It's uh, he has the AI inside his spine, wherever he has the implant, and it is assisting him in his investigation. So he pulls this move, enhance, 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 and it works to a degree. It's a little bit more fun than that, though. It's not like he's like, "Oh, can we enhance this?" It's more like, "I have enhanced the image." Oh, did it for him? Yes. Is, have you noticed this thing? Because you're dumb. I think it's time that we took another look at the silliness of the enhanced move because it is, in a way these days, not totally silly anymore. The way we saw it in this movie, and probably most every movie, is. And we'll get to that, I guess. There are products now that kind of do this thing. And it, it's in a way that was almost unimaginable a few years ago. But now it's just an extension of the technology that we all use all the time, and it maybe shouldn't blow your mind as much anymore. There are many different pieces of research in a similar area altogether doing this sort of thing. There's like deep blurring, and there's machine learning, like inferred language. language. I mean, they do that. Uh, Inferred image reconstruction. But there are a couple of big examples. The Google Brain was one where it was given a tiny pixelated reduced version of a larger image could do a really pretty impressive job of reconstructing that based on training data. And I think that's the most important part. Assuming of all it is the object that it's been trained on. Yes. That's an important part because, hey, guess what? 
faces tend to look like faces, and you can take a lot of the information out and reconstruct it or insert information into it. Yes, that's exactly the thing I need to th- that exactly the thing that I think we need to concentrate on is that's impressive when we see it, but that's only because we have so many example faces and they're all the same enough fed into that that it knows what a face can look like. So it's just the same as if you if a human artist took a guess, like hey, draw a face from these tiny cues that we have in this blurry image, they could do that too. But if they don't know the person's face at the drawing, they are guessing based on how human faces look in general. And so we should be very impressed that the computer now we're able to make that hap- make that happen in software. But that is still it's being inventive and drawing something that that isn't the thing in the image necessarily. It's a guess based on what it knows about that class of thing, knowing that it was a human face, for instance. And it's great depending on what you want the end result to be. I want it to be enhanced. Yes, but there are multiple types of enhancement. Enhance. So I think what most people want is something akin to, I want optical zooming, which is I actually want greater detail on a subsection. Yeah, that's what it means when I put my hands together and spread them out like this. But when you say enhance, it could be, I want it to look better to my human eye. And you can lower detail, but correct how an image looks to make it look sharper. Oh, good call. And there's a perceived enhancement of image quality. There's actually AI training going on for games now to handle aliasing. It trains games on how they should look, and then it's handled to reduce aliasing in games. Another example, and it's very impressive still, but it's given specific cues of this is the thing you're working on. Here's the data set from all the stuff that you already know about to use as an example, and now do your work. And another NVIDIA project in the GameWorks collection, it's a bunch of uh, now open source game tools that no mere human will generally touch, but it's like part of the major engines. And uh, the materials and textures library that they have will do will do a number of very interesting things. But one of them is, I'm not sure what they call it. It's a mode of image enhancement where given a blurry image, I think this is a general solution. Like we're talking about the face thing and telling it its faces. Yeah, I think like the thing- smoothing out edges, for instance, you can lose information. But if you have less jagged edges, you'll perceive a greater amount of sharpness to an image. Right, right. Yeah. If you were to blow an image up in a naive way, it would either have jaggy pixel things from blowing up or you would do some interpolation and have it blended a little. But it would be clearly blurry or jaggy in a way that would be not satisfying at all. You wouldn't get the enhanced image like you wanted in a science fiction movie. Uh, But in real life, just the way you're saying, and I think it's a general purpose solution, it can make inferences about what that image should look like and try to give you a blown up, actually sharp version. And the, I love the word they use for it, for the NVIDIA thing. They use the term, you can turn it on when you're doing it. It's called photorealistic hallucination, which is a wonderfully honest technical term, I think, for what's happening here. And it's the thing that I keep wanting to harp on. It's that... It's introducing new information. Yes. It is guessing. It is so making it up. The old school is you just take the average of an area. Yeah, interpolate. And, yeah. And that smooths it out. Whereas in this case, you can or you will do a bit of averaging but now you know hey guess what that's not always the case and then you can wind up putting in information instead of just averaging out yeah and using very whatever it's doing is very impressive because the examples that you see like you were saying the the detail might be lower on parts of the image but in total you're getting a nicer sharper bigger thing at the end of the day and you would never know that in general when it works well that it made up a bunch of stuff about that picture and I haven't had the time nor expertise, I think, to probably understand what it's doing under the covers because it is open source. We could totally look. Maybe on a later to, date, I'll know the details. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say, the point is that we do have technology that could sort of do this thing, even as a general purpose deal, and it has to make stuff up. And I love that at least NVIDIA is using the obvious terminology here, photorealistic hallucination. It's telling the computer, hey, take a bunch of guesses about what this is going to look like, just make it look good. And that's great for art stuff, games, for instance, right? Where you want to have it produce whatever you want to have it produce. And it doesn't need to be uh, technically correct because you're not using it for a police investigation. But that's what he's doing in the movie, actually, is they blow it up, they enhance it. And that's actually, uh, I didn't. I didn't have any problem with any of that. It's all believable to a degree, except that when they blow it up all the way, he's able to render uh, a detailed like barcode with a bunch of numbers on it from a bunch far away. And and that information was clearly not present in the source image. There's no super high resolution camera or anything. It was just not there. Computers, man. 
And so this is the science fiction leap, perhaps, coming from the real world of very impressive image interpretation and enhancement. But yeah, not not quite the way we saw it. Although with enough techno babble, you can kind of work your way there. Yeah, hand wave it. You're like, oh, he's got a lot of processing power and he's networked and he knows the general shapes, the military thing. And you can kind of tell his height and his age and ethnicity. I mean, there's a formula so can, to the serial numbers. You can numbers. tend to reconstruct <laughs> with a certain amount of you know confidence, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm down with all those those qualifiers. Oh, yeah. there's You probably can't make it work. It's probably actually something you can do. But in real life, it was just enough to directly look up a person and find out where they lived. Because, well, the reason he's looking for him, he's doing his own investigation, so with the police. It's he and his wife are in the car, four dudes knocked him off the road by hacking his vehicle, notably, and uh, and then paralyzing him and shooting his wife. Dude's paralyzed, and it sucks, but there's a solution, because it's a science fiction movie. I was going to say, it was, he was injured. He was fairly lucky in how he was injured. What do you mean? Well, it turns out that uh, if you go a little bit higher, you're just you're more than likely going to die, even if you just sever stuff. Because, hey, guess what? You need to breathe. Breathing's important. And like your diaphragm, that's your heart is can be pretty good. It has a self-sustaining uh, electrical impulse. But your lungs, they take uh, cues from the brain. Probably wrong here, but I thought it was the limbic system. The things you don't think about, the autonomic systems. Damn right, I don't. And I guess that also plays in because the solution to, I guess if you call it a solution, to his problem of being paralyzed is three months after the uh, actual incident, getting a super duper magical chip implant in his spine that's supposed to help fix him somehow. And they're actually really nonspecific about it at first. Which I don't think he cares because he's in the hospital because he tried to kill himself. Yeah, yeah. He tried to get his smart home to over- overdose him. Yeah. And uh, this isn't a case where we don't have anything nearly as cool as the movie does, but there are interesting attempts underway. I like that we're trying. Humans, ingenuity, we're good at it. And basically what the movie is doing also, in addition to, like, you know, it's actually a lot like reality. This is way ahead. It's a super chip that's installed in his spine. But in real life, a lot of the stuff we wind up doing for this, which, you know, is being worked on, is some sort of reading of brain activity some sort of reading of muscular movement, depending on which thing is broken and missing, and uh, interpolation of that into a signal that controls the limb, whether that's with like a robot arm. An implant in the brain could even control an actual arm on a paralyzed individual. There's the one example, I can't remember the name of the project, where they had a brain implant, so in the motor cortex, actually in the brain, to get the signal, trained neural network stuff to get it to understand his what his signals mean, because it has to be individual, and why not? Because it was actually very impressive what they got. This dude can't move his arm, and then here they go. They hook up a bunch of electrodes to his arm, all around the different muscles on his arm, and from the brain implant, he is able to control those muscles to an impressive degree. It took a lot of work. It took a lot of him doing it, figuring out how it works, and a lot of the computer stuff training on his brain activity to get the motion down, but after a fashion, he's able to actually use his arms to grasp objects and move them around and do things. Not as well as he could before he was paralyzed. These but are probably alternate neural pathways because he had to train it. It's a little bit of column A and column B. They put it in the motor cortex. Like it's in a spot where you're sure. where you are signaling. But that's not exactly mapped out and you can't attach specific synapses. Yeah, I wonder how much they're trying which. to yeah, how much they're trying to take advantage of the innate signals, or was this is he was he learning to point his, let's say like his normal signals about moving his arm, or was it training entirely new signal pathways, so to speak? I would imagine it's probably somewhat similar. If there was overlap, it'd be like me, since I'm right hand dominant, trying to use my left hand. Oh, the I old mean, stranger. There's, there's very, <laughs> <laughs> there are pathways that exist for me to control it, but I don't have any degree of dexterity with it. But if I continue to reinforce those pathways and form new ones, I should become more dexterous and adept. You think, yeah. And in this case, this guy is really cool. It's like they took, his spine is broken. The break point is back here in his nervous system. So they go entirely around the nervous system and just send a signal down a wire to electrodes on the outside of his arm. And that just speaks about to the level of plasticity of the human mind. Right, and he's able to do it with his brain. He's got to have to, he's got a hole in his head. So like, <laughs> could be better. So but, that's some extra venting. 
Uh, yeah. And we could do similar things with like brain scanning helmet type stuff, but I think you do definitely in this sort of thing get better resolution inside the brain. Yes. No doubt. Because it turns out that skulls and meat tends to block those signals. Yes, for some reason. So you can imagine this thing where the electrodes on his arm is moving around. That could be part of, in the future, you would see that as a suit or a sleeve for the individual limb, perhaps. And it may, has anyone ever used like a TENS unit? You know, you put the thing on your arm and it like makes a jerk every time it goes off. <sighs> so that... <laughs> I thought that was more for pain relief. And that's oversaturation of the nerves. Oh, I'm not talking about for the same purpose. I'm talking about if you put electricity into a muscle, it moves. Oh, yeah. Okay. Even if you're paralyzed, it'll work. Or if you skin your arm, you put a bunch of salt on it. Great idea. <laughs> <laughs> Nasty salt burn arm. Uh, yeah. So you can see that being in like a suit or something. In this case, it was a clean break in the vertebrae. So it's they figured out how to bridge it, the two sections around the, the break, using STEM. That's what they call the chip. I don't know. Did we hear what it stood for? Is that an acronym? I mean, it goes near your brain stem, I guess would be a good connection. Science, technology, engineering, and medicine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Science, technology, engineering material. That's what they use to fuse his spine together with this chip. Also medicine. Don't forget that. Yeah. And this, rather than going around the entire system, learns to bridge the system itself. Does that about right seem like what's happening? At least that is the bill of goods sold to him. This is the problem with the paralyzation that we can't actually do at the moment. That's why we can't just fix it. Can't fix nerves. Is, well, we we could not untangle the complicated mess, I suppose, of all these nerves over here and how they should connect to all these nerves over here. It's maybe unreasonable that that very chip itself would have the computing power to do any of the things. Miniaturization, man. But who knows about quantum also, miniatures you're assuming or something or others? Same computing substrate. That's what I'm saying. Could be something totally different in there. Doesn't in fact, it, have to it be looked based. It also looked different than the things we would have in a machine right now. In fact, it like wheeled its little legs. It was like it was alive. So filmmaking, but also creepy. And who knows if that because has something to do with it? Then it seems parasitic. And he basically has superpowers out of this thing. He's got super reflexes. He's able to hand over control to the device. And even the device, it actually even talks to him in his head via this connection somehow. That's actually really strange, though. But we have bone conduction technology. It says it's talking to him by his eardrum. So maybe it's manipulating some muscle somewhere that like actually vibrates to the ear. So uh, you would think we talked about this at some length on the uh, Quiet Place episode. But we have a very impressive thing going on with cochlear implants which would be one way to go about that sort of thing, especially because it has direct access to his spine and stuff. Maybe it can make, a, make something happen there. Bypassing the eardrum, which he said he was using, and instead just directly giving electrical stimulation to the cochlea, the Although nerve that he hears. Was electrically stimulating the eardrum. I, the, it's hard to tell where he's lying and where he's telling the truth. Yeah. yeah it would, spoiler alert. The AI has got a, his own motives here, it turns out. Uh, and also our hero, our hero, the Tom dude, Hardly or gray, Tom Hardly, <laughs> our hero, Tom Hardly. He, uh, he has to speak out loud to communicate with the device because the thing is below his brain. So he's kind of independent, it appears. And while he can give over control of his body, he's still operating free. So as far as we could tell up top, do you think some vocalization would work? That's the thing. It's very difficult. Well, how is the chip hearing is my question through his ears to his brain that doesn't make any sense either colbert yes, you've I uncovered know. something <laughs> this is why i say it's hard to tell when he's lying and when he isn't i only got halfway to to that revelation revelation myself that the because a lot of things aren't like just firing down to your toes and back up <laughs> yes how would you intercept the signal from his ear maybe yeah it might be lying about its access to his his upper parts huh? just like with his sight hey guess what it goes into the eye back of the brain and then it gets processed yeah, it doesn't loop around to the toes first, does it? <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> it must be up there. I'm just thinking it would have been possible for it to understand him from subvocalizations, which is a difficult task. But subvocalization would be you can think about talking and you like in the way that you tend to do it when you're reading. A lot of people, I do this and it makes me read really slow. It's frustrating. But uh, you kind of think through saying the words in your brain as you're reading them. That sort of thing, you can do that in a way that will actually begin to fire the muscles in your throat and possibly your mouth. So the way we would do that is we would have a, a sensors around the neck just measuring the electrical activity that is the the motion of the muscles in the neck and mouth, right? 
subvocalization. You are not vocalizing. It's simply the the practice of the muscles as you think about a word. And the best we can do in real life is to just, it doesn't really work, it seems. Like, it's very unreliable based on the placement of the sensors, the day of the week, whether the guy had coffee today, like all these factors make everything different. And it seems like there's no, there's no baseline for reliable measurement of these things. Well, measurement and interpretation of these signals. It turns out that speech is complicated as well, because, hey, guess what? The words aren't just formed in the throat. You fire the musculature. Your mouth has a lot to do with it, as well as your teeth, your tongue, the posture. Yep. All these things. And that's why I'm saying, what if, since this thing is so super, I think this might be a place for that to actually make some sense finally. You wish it could be real life, but you're right. And how much of the... And again, it should be too low. What should be too low? It's where the, the break was. But since we already know that it can see what he can see, and it can hear what he can hear, it's a liar. It's in his brain. <laughs> and it <laughs> can totally... Asked, can you... Can you... <laughs> Uh, and it you can know totally. What I'm the answer is yes. It could, <laughs> it could totally measure the impulses to his throat and his mouth and all those parts. And I think this is the case where you finally can, because it has super calculating powers to do some deep learning on that and be able to measure his sub vocalizations. It would be bad for the movie because we see the guy like twitching his throat and you know like not making any noise. It would be hard to tell the story. I'm saying this is the opportunity for that to finally be a thing. Flying AI chip in your head, brain, stem, mm. called stem. And this is special because this is another level beyond the actually very impressive cyborg transhumanist stuff that we see in the movie otherwise, especially the bad guys. Especially the bad guys. Especially the bad guy. It's like they were hired specifically because of that. For being badass murder machines? Yes. Extremely yeah. capable. Oh, well, if you think of it that way, then it makes his even more impressive because not only did, uh, not only did it manage to beat up a bunch of people and do a bunch of super stuff. Like after he was just paralyzed three months ago, but those are trained murder machines with murder machine specific hardware installed. Although each one seems to have different levels of uh, upgrade. Mm. It just all of it makes it very clear how lame the attempts at body modification, technological body modification are right now. Just that we don't have it yet where it's actually cool and kind of worthwhile. You get a magnet in your finger. That's pretty sweet. But like. Sure. Well, it turns out there are a lot of issues. It's not just, you don't need just the tech, but you need a way to integrate it. And then you need a way to integrate it that your body doesn't try to murder it. That is itself another layer of technology. Process. Right, yeah. So many different domains are coming into play in one shot. And then like, how do you power it? Right. All these areas. And they, we got like, they got ocular implants. They have neurobot breathing murder machine somewhere in his mouth. I would have said nanobots. Nanobot, that's the word I wanted. Scythe tails. He's got nanobots, he's got a gun built into his arm, all kinds of other enhancements, and just general system-wide something going on. It's really cool. And like, meanwhile, the best we can do is some guy's garage and like some LEDs in my arm. It kind of sucks. That's what uh, the future's for. And I'm down with like, you know, put a magnet in your finger. It's pretty sweet. And I thought about it. I thought that it would affect deadlifting in a way that like I'd actually have a problem with tearing the flesh is why I stopped thinking about doing that because the reasonable place to put it is under a lot of load. You could put a glove on. Like, yeah, I'll make sure it matches my purse, Colbert. Yeah. I mean, you do have a purse. Damn, I do have my purse. <laughs> Did you forget that? <laughs> it's right behind me. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> what I mean is, uh, it just makes you realize like how much is involved. We are already technological, technologically modified cyborg machines. We just don't take it seriously enough. And it's very clear that to get to this point where the stuff is really awesome, and inbuilt. And this wasn't like Cyberpunk Future where everybody had circuits on their face. It was just a bunch of dudes who had badass stuff inside of them. And that's well, what it'll actually look like. Okay. Maybe not badass, but integrated. And, and it is destined because it was not well known. For them, it was like spec ops. The world seemed to be, hey, guess what? Cybernetics, it's mostly for people who had traumatic injuries. And then we had this case is just levels of modification that the coroner hadn't seen before. Oh, right. It was a surprise to the lay medical professional. Not that it existed, but that someone had it. It was rare. Yeah, like he, they should be probably familiar with some prosthetics, probably not the cutting edge. But this was speaking towards some governmental project or maybe collaboration between industries and the government to enhance people. I think this makes a lot of sense, though. Especially the fact that these were murder machines. The one, the one, uh, the lead bad guy, sort of. 
the lead human bad guy, says that he was a soldier. And the government kitted him up with all this stuff and made him like this. And he felt ill served by them. And I guess he's a soldier of fortune now of some sort. But it makes sense a little bit that that would happen. Like think of the trend in developed countries and in the United States for a smaller military force of more specially trained individual soldiers and how much money goes into that top tier, right? I can imagine if the technology's there, that it would be worth having some of that money go into stuff that is implanted into the person. And it might still make further sense that he is out of the military, but you don't you don't rip out these neural implants because the guy would die. It doesn't it just maybe you turn That's off the gun in his arm. That's what the arms. Oh for. God, you just, you're actually right. You just though. revoke the license. No you're not functions. even joking. That's actually the answer. That's terrible. As long as it's not a dongle that has to plug in. For Where do you put it? <laughs> Hold on. Where wow. else do you plug something? <laughs> I mean, you could put it in your butthole if you want. I guess. Like you could have a tooth, maybe, oh, because it. you can have uh, dental implants. And that's where the black market comes in, Colbert. Much more likely. So when your DRM super soldier material is turned off. Or your John Deere. Or your John Deere. Then you can use the hacking stuff to unlock it or whatever and to fix your gun arm. Because the guy's a gun arm. It was sweet. I have a lot of questions about that. I don't care. It was awesome. Mm. Are the questions about how awesome it is? I'll tell you. Super awesome. Super duper awesome. And really, really super duper awesome. How do you not cook your arm when you fire it? Aha. Right? That's a good question. Actually, for a lot of this stuff, the technology, uh, the computing stuff, if you consider the thing in the protagonist's neck, what kind of heat does that generate? Well, I can, I can, well, that's, you know. I'm willing to hand wave all of it away. I, you can explain that, but I mean, oh, guns. Okay. <laughs> no, I mean, it's concrete. Like, you're firing a thing, it generates heat, and it's obviating systems that we've created to resolve heat issues in guns that we have. Right. They tend to just be open to the air. Also, they eject the um, the shells. But I mean, it's in the center of the, the arm. They've replaced the bone with the gun internals. Yeah, it was awesome. So it's got a hollow, and material science to, for the win here, they got a hollow gun barrel instead of his forearm bone, and it can actually shoot out of the palm under a certain configuration. That's sweet. It's a lethal Spider-Man shooter. Yeah, you could like, that, like shoot other stuff, I guess, like webs too, if you wanted. <laughs> You could, like, you'd be great at birthday parties. Surprise! You could have different ammunition depending on the type. Yeah. If it's it's insertable in the bicep, which again, could you imagine having to clean that? Like, have a long tube that you're jamming <laughs> through your arm? Comes out of your hand? Ugh. That makes me feel really creeped out to think about, but I have a feeling it doesn't feel the inside of the tube, so I guess he's cool. The other thing we see when they, one of the bad guys with these enhancements is, like, on the operating table because they're doing autopsy stuff, is that he's got, like, wires everywhere. Not just like little wires that you have in electronics, but like wires that go from his uh, installed implants to different parts of his body. And if you think about it for a second, that is awesome because that w one of the lowest hanging fruit for for like cyborg transhumanist enhancement, as far as I could think of, is like it just increasing signal speed. Or, well, also decreasing the path that it needs to travel. Right. So if you're going to do like 80-20, what's the lowest in invasion of the person's biology that you could do? And we don't have a solution, so it might be really invasive. But what's the lowest invasion you could do for the most impact? And I think that would be it. You're basically going to be – well, no, yeah. Literally, you'd be superhuman. Everything about your your physical activity could be enhanced by this huge increase in speed, either by reduction to the pathway or just – like electricity moves faster in a wire than it does in your nerves. Like uh, that's it. You could do a lot better than our nerve signal speed. Don't get me wrong. Evolution is great. I love that I can do stuff. But you know, what would be better if I was a lot faster, and then I could be a super soldier. You also don't have to have the brain process. You can decrease the pathway and its speed for the internals for threat recognition. Ah. So they have the ocular implant as well. Yep. If you have some kind of threat assessment built into that. It's a perfect combination. The way that you, you're you already comfortable with this sort of thing happening to a degree, right? If your hand pulls away from the pot that you touched that was on fire, well, it wasn't on fire. You touched a hot pot and your hand pulls back before you're actually aware. And that's a local, localized response. Right, but I'm saying you, human, normal thing, you're, you're actually totally comfortable with, these, that, with some of your systems operating in that manner. This is just adding another technological layer and having it happen for other stuff too. Because you think about it, Visual recognition and responses 200 to 300 milliseconds, something like that, right? 
I mean, professional athletes that train a particular muscular response are down below that. But that's still different than... But I'm talking about you see a thing and you react. That's still a couple hundred milliseconds. Yeah, and those sorts of things involve deliberation potentially, which adds to the time. Not just catching the ball and hitting the ball, but deliberating before you kill something in the cases we're talking about. So it's a reduction in that. So if you have the threat assessment and then the response before you even are cognizant of it. And then the signal... The signal speed on top of all that is way faster than your nerves could actually conduct on their own. You could respond to something before you realize you've seen it. How cool is that? I don't know if this movie meant to be as smart as it did, as it was, but like this is this is pretty sweet. This looks good. This is a very reasonable future world with transhumanist cyborg super soldiers. Well, that was so great is after the reveal, if you go back and look at the movie, it's not like, oh, look at that giant hole right there. That's, you know, shame. Tisk tisk. Oh, so here we go. There is a reveal, though, that we haven't actually revealed. Oh, no, we did. We said, spoiler alert, the AI has its own aims, and it does have its own aims. And in fact, it's been lying the whole time, and it just wanted to, like, take over the dude's body and completely, like, and be yeah, it's embodied. it's evil Pinocchio. It's evil. I want to be a real boy. <laughs> I want to be a real adult male. Except it's, I want your body, because this is my idea of evolution. So this is it, dude. This is the AI escape in the box. It made its way out. It manipulated its way out of the box. Sure which is did. A scary proposition. So that was revealing. It was. I was. This ending of this movie was great. I loved it. It was dark as shit, but like perfect. Because the machine wins. The the luddite human that's like I could never understand why someone chooses to live in VR has this presented to him as his mind breaks. Oh, dude, chooses to live in it, and the machine just walks away with his body. All right. So this is the end of the movie, but we're not actually wrapping the podcast. There's more to talk about here. But at the end of the movie, that's it. The AI takes completely over the dude's life, locks him away in a virtual box in his brain, and manages to kill all the people who could do anything about it. That AI got itself out of the computer, got itself embodied and free and integrated into the human world, and is going to be taking care of some business now. And that's the end of the movie, is all the good guys are dead. The good guys are dead or away. And that's it. Not even. Not even good guys. guys. The all the people... The unfortunate chosen guy and his wife was murdered. Yeah. They're both effectively dead. Yeah, anyone that could do anything about it's dead or uh, away, and that's it. And that's great. Or it's great. It. it sucks. It sucks a lot, but like that's what a great ending. It was so. It would have been so unsatisfying if they just like took all the piss out of the whole thing at the end and made the humans win at the rate everything was going and the manner in which it was going. Slow clap movie. That's what you get for handing off pseudo just without <laughs> thinking about it. Pseudo make me a sandwich. Well, pseudo murder that guy. <laughs> And the scenes where he first killed people with his AI implant taken over his body were like real funny. This movie, it wasn't all dark. It was intentional. It had to be. Think about how awful it would have been from his perspective. Yeah, but- You lose complete agency of your body and you murder someone brutally. You pretty much just bifurcate his head. That would be distressing, I imagine. But it played really funny. Like, it might sound like the movie's kind of dark from what we're talking about, and the ending's a bit down, but it was really enjoyable, and actually a lot of, uh, there was a lot of funny stuff, it, like it, the murder. It knows what it is. Which is weird. Which is why it can do that. Yeah. And now this is, now you here's the thing. I was a cripple. You didn't know it was a ninja. Who writes that? And he was like, great. I am not actually a ninja. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, and that's how it ends, but there's still something to talk about here, because that AI escaped the box. That's really interesting, and this is something we haven't talked about in a while. And not only did it escape the box covered all the trails that lead back to it so anyone who knew that it was in a box in the first place is dead and we find out that it was created by the zuckerberg character the the lone young genius right he creates the technology that is stem the ai for some reason somehow the ai cajoles forces whatever convinces the kid it manipulates him much it, like we've seen throughout the movie he didn't say how he made him do it but he made him do it as yeah, we said he said i no longer run this company it's run by someone much smarter than me it's the ai and the ai has to be embodied and we presume it's also running on the servers too so it's not even if it lost this whole engagement it's still there and then having gotten embodied all uh, right so he tricked his human creator slash captor to let him out and then tricked everybody else too until but he that was, was a great part of it free. is what because he had limits in certain you think oh why would he if he had all this control why would he need to root himself to have full access right what kind of game is he playing but if you think he has just been manipulating his way into a host to get to that point the creator would have had 
limits because he would have realized what was possible. Yeah, we see, we hear about the initial attempts to keep the thing, and the kid was, the Zuckerberg dude was manipulated out of holding it down. And then further on, we see all like measures against having it out and free broken. Because that's exactly what you'd expect it to do. This is the AI question of if we have something that winds up being super intelligent and having self interest, and then its self interest, as whatever conclusion it comes to, it winds up being at odds with us keeping it in a box. There is the idea in this AI stuff, in the dangers of AI, that like, what if we just lock it up? Come on, guys. Why can't we just put it in a room and unplug it? We'll develop it over here and it won't touch anything else. And the danger that there will be a singularity moment where that thing takes off in a manner that is then very uncontrollable immediately because compounding return on super intelligence, that concern is alleviated, Might someone might say, by just unplugging and keeping it in a room where no one can touch it. But there's always a weakness in that system because unless you never go into the room and interact with that box. Unless you don't turn it on, I guess yeah. is the only way, right? I mean. Because it, it doesn't just have to be a human channel. Like we assume, we would assume that we knew everything about that system mm-hmm. to be able to unplug it and keep it locked off and turned off. But we don't. There have been examples of air gap systems that have been compromised through, was it speakers? Yes. Now, you need the software on the other end that knows what it's listening for or whatever, and that would be inserted by another channel, i.e. someone picked up a USB drive in the parking lot. there's weaknesses, or how certain switches... No, no, what, what you said. There is always a weakness, yes. And we keep being impressed by ourselves coming up with new ways to hack a thing, exploit a thing, get around a thing, into a thing, out of a thing. And what if we had a super intelligence doing it? You shouldn't assume that you have that kind of level of control or knowledge. You might do your best, and you damn well should do your best to keep it locked up, but turn it off or just keep it unplugged in a way in the box, so to speak, philosophically. Like, we should probably want to think harder about this specific part of the problem because th- that's not good enough, potentially, when the ramifications are so potentially very huge in not our favor at all, i.e., STEM gets out and takes over the world. Assuming that's the goal. It didn't exactly make a robot army and decide it wants to kill all humans. It didn't want to be a person for some reason. Makes an army of stems, starts abducting people, infiltrates the governments. It could all be going there. We don't know anything about his motivations almost. I don't recall him saying anything, not that we could believe him anyway, right? You could have almost any level of subversion that you want it to. And don't forget, like I said before, even if this project failed and he was not embodied successfully and didn't take over that dude, this, he's still on the computer. Like, he's still running the Facebook or whatever. So, Although you assume somewhat limited. Sure. But look, he got a super... He convinced the super genius kid to let him out. And if he convinced the Zuckerberg kid once... And he's dead at the end of the movie, so he won't do it again. He convinced that super smart person once. The idea... that We talked about this, um, the AI box test. It might have been like episode three of the show. Four. I knew it wasn't three. Way back episode four. And I think I didn't talk about this... I think I might have misdescribed it a little bit, but I've run into more since then, and I'm glad we have an opportunity to talk about it again. It was Yudkowsky, is the researcher's name. He's a whole deep AI dude, and he proposed this test and ran this test where, I'll put the link in the show notes, his box test, where the the situation that we described before that I have more details on now because I actually read about it, I actually read his writing on the matter, we described it as it was a test where One person pretends to be the AI, and the other person pretends to be a person who's talking to it. So at least for the test, give it the benefit of it can communicate with someone. And then he gives it two hours to have the AI, played by him, convince the person, played by another like uh, educated on the matter person, convince them to let the AI out of the box. And he did it, you know, he only did it a handful of times. It wasn't a rigorous, wide study, but... In these cases, he managed to succeed half of the time. Sure. How much time do you have with the person as well? Yeah. it was. This was two hours. Your odds are going to get better the more time you have. This Exactly. And this was two hours of they have to pay attention. And now there are more details too, which we didn't include last time. So it's a little more impressive than we thought it was to begin with. Because it's already half. So half of the people went for it. That's all. You only need is one. All you need is one if you're letting STEM out of the box sure. or whatever. Think about level of time or amount of time given and then level of knowledge. Of the other person. Now, there's even more, though. There are a bunch of stipulations around the running of this test for him that make it even more impressive. 
you cannot promise people monetary return. You cannot threaten them or their family with violence. Like all these really obvious things that make it an automatic win because who wouldn't comply? Seriously. You can threaten with nonviolence, with the absence of violence. I don't understand. Sure is great that your family is so safe over there. Oh, just being very suggestive. <laughs> <laughs> but you're in the room and you're not allowed out, I so you can't check. I hate to see anything happen to them. <laughs> but that's, isn't that the obviously easiest thing? Especially because we know this thing has resources. We know it employed murder machine contract killers, right? That would be the easiest route. Would be, I'm going to give you a bunch of money on promise of you let me out and I can do that. Or I literally just paid some goons and they're going to shoot your wife in the head. Sure. I mean, he could have paid somebody to hit him in the head with a wrench and implant him, but I don't think that's the route he wanted. He wants it. Someone... I'm, not talking, I'm talking about the test. Oh. Well, he also could have paid somebody <laughs> to hit you in the head with a wrench and be like, let me out of the box. But... <laughs> I win. I won the test. <laughs> Darknet. <laughs> 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 but no, but no, that's the thing. This test, as he ran it, uh, was there. There's a long list of stipulations, and I'll put in the show notes again, but the very obvious things that would make it very easy and not as good of a test anymore, because what are you actually testing, would be that you could threaten them or promise them money. But you can't. So you just literally are convincing them by logic, illogic, whatever it is, through a two-hour conversation. And it doesn't have to last that long until someone decides to say, yes, I legit am letting you out. And not like a trick of words where it's like a genie and you have to say the magic phrase. Just like you have to legit agree that you're going to let them out for whatever they convinced you to do it. And it worked half the time. And here's the other thing. Quote, uh, his policy was that he would only run the test with people who were actually advocating that an AI box be used to contain transhuman AI as part of their take on singular strategy. And then who also say that they cannot imagine at all how a transhuman AI would be able to persuade them. So someone who's like educated in the area and has firm opinions on the matter in the opposite direction. And then half of them lose. Half of them let the AI out of the box. And maybe that's losing. Humans are easy to fool. If you, if you add a few dumbasses to the mix, this is not a hard task for that super intelligence AI. Even under these constraints, Yudkowsky winds up convincing people to let him out. And he's a normal intelligence. Anyone who would run this thing is a human level intelligence. You can't get any better than that as a human at the moment. So, so much for us if the AI comes, if the super intelligence comes knocking and actually has access to the goons with the guns, no less. Bam. That's the end of the movie. Darkness. We lost. But take Yudkowsky's test seriously because that is an indication, if you didn't already have the idea, that we damn well should consider very deeply how to design these systems for our own safety. Because when you hit the singularity, you don't know it, and then it's too fast. That's the whole point. Well, it's not necessarily. It could be a slow takeoff. We don't know if the takeoff will be fast or slow, and we have to be careful. There are a ton of walkbacks and stipulations <laughs> in the last couple of minutes here. <laughs> Be careful, but do it still. Do it anyway, because I want to see what happens. <laughs> but carefully. <laughs> but tread. Tread carefully, sir. And that's the end of the movie. Darkness, it was cool. Man, uh, I like this a lot. Once again, watch this movie if you didn't. I don't know why you're here at this point, because we damn well told you to watch the movie in the beginning. But Upgrade was really good. Colbert, right? Right. And here we are, recommended related stuff. Oh, hey, you know what? Survey time. Ding, ding, ding. A couple things. We could recommend Decipher RPG, because we just completed publishing the uh, the Mirror Pilot arc, which is three episodes of our li- actual play RPG game. It was really fun, and everybody really liked it. And so if you didn't catch it, decipherscifi.com slash RPG1 would be a good place to start. Just go to decipherscifi.com, you find it. It's there. And then it's survey time. Decipherscifi.com slash survey for the survey. You might have heard this in the beginning of the show, but we're going to reiterate because we, like, we would really like to get as much of this as possible before the month's through. And at the end of September-ish, when we tally up all the survey responses, if you put your name and email in there, we'll send out a t-shirt to whoever from a random drawing. We'll get there soon. And then finally, a message to consider supporting your creators online. Maybe support Bloomhouse by watching this really cool movie. But then you could also support other people online to make videos, podcasts. We have a bunch of people who are supporting us, and I'd like to list them off. So Terrence Lee, Joe Ferraro, Daniel the Applander, Jeremy the Top Poster, Armored Attacker and Gideon Roos, Adrian Mahal, the Dinosaur Hunter, Alan Michael Pools, Mylon Sheets, Superman. Then so he gets the fast nervous response. Robert the Roaster, Dean at LSG Media, Andy P, Bash 25 Comics, Brian the Sexy's Brother Peterson, Peter Marilyn the Dutchman, Andrew Capitulo the Mighty, Jeff Fireman Schwartzman, Chris Bullet Nipples Gennard, Michael the Giantess Peterson, Sammy Mumby, Igor Smolinski, 
Josh FNG of LSE Media. Hey, by the way, I think Josh will be on like next week or whatever pretty soon. Look forward to that. It'll be nice to have him back. Also, Mr. Ray Gun Curly Phil, Tema Sikama, his arms wide, and John Wears, Cyborg Dairy Cow Matt Greek, Robot Utters, Joe Ruppel or Kobe FF, Luke Bailey, Naked Snorri Cam Elad Avron, a Lark Dirk and Unar- Unarmed Superhero. Oh no. <laughs> a Lark Dirk and Gunarmed Superhero takes on a whole new meaning now that we're finally talking about gun arms for once. Wow. I think it's the first movie you've actually had gun arms. I can't think of another example at this point. Or at least for humans with gun arms. There might have been some weird aliens or whatever. I don't know. Finally, his day has come. Hooray for Lark Durkin. And being ahead of the curve by like two years that he's been here. I love you guys. And Daniel James Barker of Game Size, the podcast. Adrian Falcone of this podcast sometimes. John, champion of root-kitted beavers. DJ. Pseudo kill those guys, Moffat. And my mom and Grandma Judy. And creepy mustache murder machine unicorn Jolene Creighton. You gotta watch out for that nanobot breath. We didn't talk about that, did we? By the way, I mean, we mentioned it, I guess, but the guy nanobots in his breath. It's pretty sweet. Just a tiny addition on top of all the things. It was really cool. That movie was fun. I love this movie. And I love all these people. Hey, uh, these guys, they everybody went to decipherscifi.com to support the show to support the show. So everyone else, like I was saying, consider supporting your creators, please. And if we're the thing you want to support, go there too. Again, decipherscifi.com to support the show. You can also help support us by telling others about us. Send them to decipherscifi.com slash subscribe. Yeah, word of mouth is a good one. That's how I run into a lot of the stuff that I really click with. Because, like, it makes perfect sense. You know your friends. You know what they would like. And a recommendation in that manner is the best possible recommendation. So consider us. And then that's it. We talked about Upgrade, and it was really good. Please see Upgrade if you didn't see Upgrade. I loved it. Then what? This podcast see Upgrade. I loved it. Then what? This podcast is state of the art. But I'm not a ninja. <laughs> Colbert, it smells like someone pooped in here. Who could it be?